So the key messages from my presentation is that the treatments for ovarian cancer have improved over the last decade or more, and there are lots of options for patients now. Um, there's been great progress uh, over the last few years. And what I went through in the presentation was uh, linking in standard of care um, for patients with ovarian cancer, uh, and also the newer treatments that are licensed and also potentially on the horizons uh, in the context of clinical trials. So clinical trials are critical for us to make progress in improving outcomes for women with ovarian cancer. And one of the most um, uh, topical examples at the moment is the development of PARP inhibitors. So, and this can illustrates the importance of preclinical laboratory research and then taking this through to early phase clinical trials, so that's called phase one, and then to the later stages of randomized trials, which then ultimately leads to uh, licensing. So, uh, uh, one of the examples that I talked about today was the development of uh, the PARP inhibitor, Alaparib, um, also known as Limparza. Um, and I was very, very pleased to talk about the SOLO-1 trial, um, which has been the latest uh, uh, significant practice-changing trial, uh, which was reported at ESMO in 2018. And uh, this trial was in the, for the first line uh, treatment for women with BRCA-mutated ovarian cancer and showed that for women that had a BRCA mutation, had had surgery and responded to um, chemotherapy, um, if they were to uh, be treated with a PARP inhibitor, a Laparib, compared to placebo, there was a substantial improvement in time before the disease getting worse, by that I mean progressing. Um, and that has led to FDA approval in December and EMA um, a positive opinion uh, last month. Uh, and more recently, uh, only this week, this was discussed at NICE. So one of the um, frustrating challenges with ovarian cancer is that um, perhaps although that there may be responses to treatment initially, the cancer tends to come back um, and it's about treating the cancer effectively for as long as possible, having treatment breaks and then attacking it again with a new treatment. Um, and we're in the era now of more personalised treatments and targeted therapies. For example, bevacizumab that attacks blood vessels that feed cancer and PARP inhibitors um, that are uh, approved in women with BRCA mutations and also regardless of having a BRCA mutation. And this could only be possible um, through uh, the uh, substantial number and thousands of women all over the world participating in clinical trials. Um, other exciting approaches or potentially promising approaches uh, that are being investigated in trials is immunotherapy um, in combination with other treatments, for example, PARP inhibitors uh, or antiangiogenic therapy. Uh, rather disappointingly, um, the use of immunotherapy alone, um, so the PDL1 uh, inhibitors, has not uh, uh, been so active enough to lead to changing practice. Uh, uh, for women with ovarian cancer. So we need to understand this more and also um, tailor the treatment to the right patients uh, and combinations as part of that. And there are a number of trials going on internationally. For example, um, open in the UK is the EORTC1508 trial, which I have the privilege of uh, leading um, with George Kukos in Lausanne. And this is looking at bevacizumab in combination with immunotherapy, a drug called atezolizumab, and also looking at the role of aspirin. So in many of these trials, um, patients undergo biopsies, and this is critical for us to understand resistance mechanisms um, so that we can better tailor and target the next treatments for that patient, but also learn for other patients in the future. So clinical trials are essential for us to make progress um, for women with ovarian cancer and it's very important that all women have the opportunity uh, to access clinical trials across the UK and globally uh, and I appreciate that can be a challenge and that's why it's really important for collaborations both nationally and internationally so we can get the best treatments to our patients at the right time. Um, so in the UK 
uh, for example, um, given where we're talking today, there, there, are, there is an excellent network called the NCRI, the National Cancer Research Institute Network, um, a very active group in gynaecological cancers, um, and we work together within the UK, but also internationally, for example, with NGOT and also the GCIG, uh, which I'm privileged to be part of. Um, the key is about communication, so patients are aware of asking their oncologists about whether a clinical trial is applicable, and also for people that run clinical trials like myself um, to be open to reviewing these cases and, um, and offering clinical trials. Um, it's not just about drug treatments. There are clinical trials in surgery and also radiotherapy, um, and also importantly looking at the patient experience and quality of life and supporting patients throughout their treatment and cancer journey. Um, another important aspect of trials is actually looking for better biomarkers to predict um, outcomes for women and also uh, for us to learn about um, resistance to treatments. And in my research program, uh, we link in very closely from the Royal Marsden to the laboratories in the Institute of Cancer Research and also beyond in order to help uh, answer those questions and develop the next trials going forward. So I'm very pleased to say that there's a lot of enthusiasm um, from researchers, uh, pharmaceutical industry, academic collaborations, and most importantly, patients. Um, in entering clinical trials and participating in research, research um, to, in order to improve um, the survival and the experience um, uh, and treatments during ovarian cancer. Um, what's, what's relatively um, uh, new uh, and being able to be delivered now is also focusing on the rarer types of ovarian cancer um, because we know that all treatments aren't applicable to all women with ovarian cancer. There are some rarer subtypes, for example, low-grade serous ovarian cancer and clear cell carcinoma, where women are sometimes excluded from participating in some of the current larger trials. So, for example, there is an academic collaboration based on preclinical lab research from the Institute of Cancer Research, and we hope to open a trial called ATARI later this year. And that's looking at targeting and directing therapy according to a molecular abnormality called ARID1A and using uh, a, a new class of drugs called ATR inhibitors, either alone or actually with PARP inhibitors. In this particular trial, uh, the PARP inhibitor um, is a, a laparib. And this could only work if there's true collaboration um, nationally and also internationally. So this trial hopefully will open in the UK, led by myself, um, and also uh, in France and Canada at the moment. I very much wish it would be open worldwide. So it's very important that patients have access and the opportunity to enter clinical trials uh, and to ask their oncologists if there is a trial relevant for them and where they can be referred to. For example, at the Royal Marsden we see patients not only in our local area but nationally as well. Um, and we run a number of uh, trials at any one time across gynaecological malignancies from the most early phase, phase one, through to the phase three clinical trials. Not only are trials about drug treatments, but also surgery and other modalities of treatment, as well as supporting uh, patients through treatment and working out the real-world experience of patients with new drugs. Mm -hmm. I'd very much like to thank patients and their carers um, and all the charities that work together, um, because without support for our patients and access to clinical trials and access to new treatments, then it wouldn't be possible to do this. Mm -hmm.